Bikes are very draggy, and a lot has been done over the years to reduce their drag. For example, when a cyclist pedals his or her legs up and down, that creates a huge amount of drag and a lot of turbulence. One ingenious way of reducing that drag is to widen the front forks so that their wakes hit the rider's legs. That then reduces how much good fresh flow is wasted on them, and that reduces the drag in turn. But another region that could use work is the actual rims of the bike. For bikes, this region usually remains very open, and that means that air can whip through there and potentially increase the drag. On the other hand, bikes used for indoor circuits often have either one rim or both rims closed to some extent at least, as we see in figure 2.2 on the bottom right here. But how much does that really affect the drag? In this podcast, that's what we're looking at. And to do that, we're looking at this paper here called Aerodynamic Effect of Bicycle Wheel Cladding, a CFD Study. It's open access and you can find the link below, and the DOI is at the bottom of the page. So to test how covering the rims which the authors call cladding, and how different amounts of cladding affect the drag, they use CFD, so computer simulations. This cladding is kind of like how closed the rims are on a car, and for cars, closing rims pretty much always reduces the drag, and quite a lot. So it'll be interesting to see if we have the same effect here for this bike or not. And on, as a side note, if you'd like us to simulate your very own car, let us know here. So for those interested in the details of the author's CFD setup here, we'll, con we'll continue on them now. For those who want to see the results, then jump to this timestamp here. So for their CFD setup, they use something called the Favre Average Navier-Stokes Equation, so fans instead of rands. This is a little weird and also a term that isn't too commonly talked about. So the, fa the fans, so Favre Average Navier-Stokes Equations, takes into account changes in the density of a fluid. They are usually used for compressible flows. It could be argued that it should be used for high turbulent flows because that can change the density locally, but the results have shown that it's not really necessary. RANS is usually pretty good for that anyway. So the reason why the author selected it instead of the regular Reynolds Average Navier-Stokes Equations, the author said is because it simplified the simulations. Either way, they used RANS. Either way, they used RANS or fans. That would be fine. They used fans here though. And for the computational domain, we can see in figure 2.5, that is very long. So the length chosen was because of a general urban flow field guide, suggesting that that length here would be good. But I wouldn't be surprised if that length could be reduced dramatically and still get good results. The length is very long, and that means more cells are needed. That means it takes longer to do the simulation. So they used the K-Epsilon Turbulence model, which wouldn't be my choice either. It's fine, but the K-Omega SST model would be better. But one thing I noticed um, is that I couldn't really find the Y plus values reported. That is an important point because the K epsilon terminus model works best between Y plus values of around 30 up to about 300. So whether their mesh falls in that range or not is a mystery to me. If they use the K omega ST model, even if they didn't report the Y plus value, it'd probably still be fine because the model can handle values from anywhere like one or less up to about 300 or so. Anyway, the authors did a grid independent study, which is great. That way they can get a mesh that gives results that are independent of the number of cells that are used. And in figure 2.9, we see the results of their study right here. So this study was run for the bike without cladding and at a velocity of six meters per second, which is about 22 kilometers per hour or so. So a pretty gentle ride. The top plot is for something called line two and the bottom plot is for something called line 8. And honestly, I found this a little bit confusing, so I'll try to explain what these lines are referring to. So figure 2.8b, so the right part here, we see a bunch of colored dots in the column, in, in these columns. So from left to right, these lines are then called line 1 to line 9. Line 1 is the red line, and ni line 9 is the black line here. So for the plots below, the green and pink lines are the ones taken from uh, this graph, and they're the velocities shown in these regions along the wheel, so up and down. Then between the different meshes, these velocities um, values have been compared to. And that brings us to the mesh uh, used. So they tested four different ones. They used mesh 1, mesh 2, and mesh 3, and mesh 4. They gave values between 4 million and 5 million cells for these different meshes, and honestly, 
that's probably not as much of a span as needed. Usually you try to get around double the number of cells between each mesh refinement level. The reason is because if you only in increase the number of cells you use a little bit each time, then the values are going to be less likely to change simply because the meshes are similar, not because you've reached a mesh dependent value now. Here, the mesh increased overall by 20% between the coarsest mesh, so mesh 1, and the finest mesh, mesh 4. The good thing is that in figure nine, in figure 2.9, sorry, the mesh results are all pretty much the same. They are all small differences here and there, but overall, they follow the same trends, and there's like a maybe a percent or two difference overall, generally speaking. So I guess the mesh might be in an independent state so far. Anyway, they decided to use the coarsest mesh, and that can be seen in figure 2.10. And in the top plot in this figure, you can see that there's like this layer of cells close to the ground. It's quite fine, and it encompasses the entire rider. But then, all of a sudden, the cells become quite a bit coarser. And this, to me, is quite surprising. I would have thought that putting this layer a little thicker would be better, so the coarse mesh doesn't start all of a sudden at the rider's uh, noggin, the top of it. So you get a bit of a buffer layer. But let's go to the validation study to see if the mesh was good overall. So in table 3.1, we see the drag area of the simulations at 10 meters per second, 8 meters per second, and 6 meters per second. They then compare the values to two other published works. The thing that stands out to me is that their values, while off by a few percent, they are consistently off by that amount. So for example, comparing that to um, Dravkovich's values, they are consistently about 4.5% off. Then for defraised data, they're consistently about 2% off. That's pretty impressive. That tells us that their mesh overall seems pretty good. It's staying consistent at least. So I think their force data can be trusted. Now, as a side note, if you'd like to learn OpenFoam, which is a very powerful CFD software, so you, so you can do these simulations yourself or any others, then check out our Black Friday course sales on here. I think you might like them. Anyway, let's move on to the results. Let's see how different wheel claddings affect the drag. So in figure 4.1, we see the velocity field plot for the completely open rims, and this is at 10 meters per second. So the thing that stands out to me is that most of the wake is definitely at a downwards angle. That suggests that lift is produced, and that's interesting. The second thing that really stands out to me is that inside the rims, the speed of the flow at the top of the rims is the fastest out of anywhere in the flow. That's even more interesting because that's where the wheels are pushing forwards, and I would have thought that that would, if anything, push the flow forwards a little more, decelerate it, and make it a lower speed here. But it doesn't seem to do that. At the bottom of the rim, the exact opposite thing occurs too. But what all this does tell us is that there is potential for the covering of the rim to affect the aerodynamics of the bike. You can see that there is quite a bit of aerodynamics going on here, and maybe the covering will change that. And in figure 4.2, we now see the term intensity values with different amounts of cladding, 0% in the top plot and 80% in the bottom plot. And this is important to note, so the 80% is in the middle section and the outer part of the rims are not covered. I'm sure that would quite uh, change the flow physics, but maybe in a later date we'll cover that. Anyway, this is very interesting because what this shows is how churned up the flow is. The more red it is, the more turbulence there is, and that means that the flow is more churned up. With no cladding, so the top plot, there is definitely more turbulence behind the rear wheel. That suggests that the bike with 80% cladding, or at least the wheel isn't slicing and dicing through the air as efficiently as a top bike without cladding. And, and that, at the very least, would probably mean that the bottom wheels are reducing the vortex drag of the wheel because the wakes are probably a little bit smaller, it seems, at least the turbulence is. So that's a good omen for figuring out if the drag drops. So we'll see later on more data on that. Now in figure 4.3, we see the streamlines for the flow in and around the bike. It's colored in the velocity, and the bottom part of the flow is obviously changing between the completely open uh, rims and the completely closed rims. So the bottom part of the wheels, the wheels with 100% cladding, seem to churn up the flow nearly, not nearly as much as the open wheels, and the flow in there that does get churned up seems to be more ordered, so the circular patterns are more distinct. That indicates less mixing, and that also agrees with what we saw in figure 4.2, where the terminus intensity level is lower around the wheels where there was cladding. So they all kind of agree, and that 
indicates that it's probably better for drag reduction too. But in terms of the actual drag savings, in figures 4.4 to 4.8, we see the values. And these graphs are a little repetitive, mainly um, 4.7, but we'll get to that later. Let's first look at 4.4. So this shows the overall drag force. And this is important because this is literally the drag force the cyclist will feel when riding along. This is how much is resisting the motion. So the x-axis is the percentage of cladding. So 0% means the rim is completely open. 100% is the rim is completely closed. The y-axis is the drag force in newtons. Then there are three lines on the plot, green, red, and blue. The green is for 10 meters per second, the red is for 8 meters per second, and the blue is for 6 meters per second. Now we need to remember that this is for the drag and not the drag coefficient. We'll see the drag coefficient below. Here, because this is the drag, the actual value on the y-axis is proportional to the velocity squared. That's important because first of all, the green line is much higher than the other two, which means more drag is generated, that's fine, but that's to be expected because the velocity is higher too. And the thing uh, more to look for in this graph is that what the lines are doing, not really so much what the actual values are. Here we can see that all three lines drop as the cladding percentage increases. That means the drag drops as you cover the rim more. That's great. And the other thing that's interesting is that the trend is consistent across the velocity range that was tested. And that's also great because that makes the effects of this cladding predictable. It also means that planning a cycle is easier because you don't have to worry about sticking to a particular speed zone because the efficiency still increases as you increase the velocity anyway. So that's all good. The other interesting thing is that as the cladding percentage increases, the drag force drops more and more. That tells us that not only is more cladding better, but it's even better than just a linear line. So in figure 4.5, we see the percentage change in the drag as a percent. I should note that the y-axis says the drag coefficient, but I'm pretty sure that's a typo, and it's actually the overall drag. And this shows that we're seeing up to about a 5% drop in the drag with completely covered rims. That is a big gain and could be the difference between being the winner and being the first loser. But this is for the drag force. And while this helps them understand the overall effects in a real world situation, it doesn't tell us what is happening to the actual efficiency of the design and the drag coefficient. And in figure 4.6, we see the drag coefficient at these different speeds now. The first thing that stands out is that the drag is lower for the higher the speed is. The drag coefficient, sorry. We can see that at about 10 meters per second with no cladding, the drag coefficient is about 1% lower than at 6 meters per second, so the green line compared to the blue line. That's not a lot, and by itself, that could be within the error of the simulation. But given that this general trend holds across so many different simulations, so from 0% uh, cladding up to 100% cladding, it seems like it's probably true. So we can probably conclude that going faster, or well, that does increase the overall drag, it still drops the drag coefficient, and so the e efficiency increases too. The other thing that stands out from this graph is that, like the actual drag plot, the drag coefficient plot shows that with increasing cladding, the drag coefficient continues to drop too. So that's good. Now in terms of the effect on the ride, in figures 4.8, we see something really cool. So the authors have done a calculation here, they figured out how much of a difference these changes in the drag coefficient affects the amount of time it takes to cover 1,000 meters. So if you wanted to travel cycle over 1,000 meters, how much would the time change with this cladding? And from a racing point of view, that's very important. A few seconds shaved off the time could change who wins. And here, we see something very interesting. So overall, cladding the rims saves you time, and that is for all these velocities tested. And the more cladding this rims have, the more time is saved. That makes sense because the drag coefficient and drag overall drop too. At 10 meters per second at 100% of the cladding, the time required to cover 1000 meters drops by 20 seconds. Is that good? Well, the fact that there is a drag reduction here and a reduction in time is definitely good. But more than that, at 10 minutes per second, it takes about 100 seconds to cover 1000 meters. With this drag reduction, the associated increase in velocity and the amount of time saved, that drops from 100 seconds to 80 seconds now. 
So that's a 20% drop in time. That's insane. For just a few percent drop in drag, this time saving is huge. And the same goes for the other two velocities as well. And one thing that stands out here is that as the velocity drops, the amount of time saved increases. And initially that might seem odd because up until now, um, we've seen that the higher the velocity is, the greater the saving is. Here we're seeing there's a greater saving if you have a lower velocity. But let's think about what's happening. So as the speed drops, it takes more time to cover 1000 meters. So the drag reduction you get occurs over an entire period. So naturally uh, there will be more of a time saving for lower speeds. So this is greater, this greater time saving isn't necessarily better percentage wise from that point of view. It's just greater because the overall time required to travel 1000 meters is greater too. So the percentage uh, change might still be the same or around the same. Now, one final thing to talk about is that while the drag drops, it doesn't mean that it makes it easier for the rider to travel that distance. If the wind direction is exactly head on, then it does. But if there's a slight crosswind, then covering the rim more means more of a side force will be created. And that can make it very difficult to control the bike then. And if, if, even if the drag drops by a similar amount still, the side force created can still make it difficult to control and that makes it harder to ride, just in a different sense. But still, the drag reduction is very interesting and, for certain circumstances, very valuable. And with that, we come to the end of this podcast. If you liked it, hit the me liking and subscribe buttons. And if you'd like us to simulate your very own car, let us know. And if you'd like us, and if you'd like to learn Open Foam so you can do your own simulations and check out our courses below, then they currently have a Black Friday sale on, which I think you might like. So check them out. And another aspect of cycling that changes aerodynamics is leg position. If you'd like to learn about how the cycling motion changes the aerodynamics of a bike, check out this podcast episode here. Peace out, amigos.